Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at The Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center, and Damon Linker of The Week. Our special guest is Anne Applebaum, noted author, contributor to The Atlantic, and um, author most recently of a piece that got our attention called Coexistence is the Only Option. Welcome one and all. I want to jump right in with you, Anne, uh, because this uh, essay that you wrote, I think, touches upon the great question that all of us are facing in this um, post, post-insurrection uh, world. Uh, bec- and I say that because it really has changed our sense of the stakes here, that, that we don't just have, that we're not just living in a divisive time, we're living in a time of um, severe, severe strains on our national life. And as you put it, I'll just read uh, from your piece, you said about the secessionists, you said they declared that they want to live in a different America from the one the rest of us inhabit, ruled over by a different president. And yet they cannot be wished away or sent away or somehow locked up. They will not leave of their own accord. And Americans who accept Biden's lawful victory won't either. We have no choice except to coexist. So um, tell us, uh, you, one of your wonderful strengths as a writer is that you bring an international perspective um, to everything. And and you, you've cited some examples from other nations that have dealt with severe internal strains, and uh, you're, you're hoping to find some way out there. Can you describe some of that? Sure. I mean, the, the examples that I used will sound pretty extreme to Americans, and I don't mean to say that these are blueprints or it's exactly like that, but the way of thinking that, for example, um, people, people when that people applied to Northern Ireland, which was a, a society that had a you know a terrorist movement, really more than one terrorist movement, that divided and polarized um, the society for decades, um, made it impossible for people to speak to one another, and involved like our system, like like as in our situation, um, people who had very different ideas of what the constitutional order should be. Um, or if you look at a country like Colombia, which had a violent insurgency for many decades, and then had to reintegrate that the insurgents back into society after they declared the end of the Civil War. Um, these are societies, and there are many others, that have practiced um, a set of techniques or policies that sometimes go under the rubric of peace building. Sometimes it's called conflict resolution or post-conflict resolution. Um, and usually what they involve is trying to find ways of getting having people get along without killing each other. Um, and since that is a relevant, <laughs> that is now a, you know, a relevant problem in America, I thought, well, what does this look like in the context of the United States? And there's sort of two or three ideas that I borrowed. Um, one of them is the idea that if you have people who have to live together in a community and they have completely different ideas about how that community should be run, the very best thing you can do is not talk about it, um, which is very counterintuitive, drives people crazy. But you know, the, the point is, if you get a, a person who believes Trump is president and a person who, believes, person who believes Biden is president in the same room and have them argue about it, it's not going to fix the problem. Um, and so it's much better to talk about something else. So talk about building a new road in your town or building bridges or, you know, at the national level, um, talk about getting people vaccinated or getting, um, you know, getting the economy running again. I mean, in a way, I think that Biden, whether knowingly or intuitively, I think he understands this and this was how his campaign was run. Um, And so far, it's been how his presidency was run. In other words, don't pick fights. You know, don't go down the road of big constitutional arguments. Instead, focus on things that we can all do together. And this is usually something that's done at a local level. I mean, I don't know, in Northern Irish villages, they would build a local community center together or something, or they would, I don't know, even literally putting up Christmas lights. There were things that people could do that 
were of mutual benefit to everybody and that didn't involve arguing over which country they lived in. Um, and there is something of that flavor of that attitude that I think we need now, even though it's, as I said, profoundly annoying to people. I mean, there are, obviously there are people who want um, anyone who committed a crime to be brought to justice, and this doesn't nullify that. And there are people who think, and I agree with them, that Donald Trump should be, um, you know, should be, should pay a price for what he did. Um, nevertheless, that doesn't address the problem of the literally millions of people. We're talking about millions of Americans who don't accept the constitutional order. And so we need to be more creative and thinking about them. Another idea from that world of conflict resolution that I'll throw in um, is the idea that you find trusted messengers. So we on this podcast and most of us listening to this podcast are not in a position to be able to reach people who believe that Donald Trump is still president. Um, they don't listen to us. I mean, remember, these are people who now, it's not just that they don't believe the media, you know, or the mainstream media. They don't believe Congress. They don't believe the vice, the former vice president. They don't believe election officials in, in, in their states. They don't believe Republican election officials like the ones in Georgia and Arizona who certified the vote. They don't believe anybody. And so finding anyone who can reach them, whether it's, you know, those few Republicans who still somehow straddle both sides of the divide, whether it's religious leaders, whether it's business leaders, it, you know, uh, finding people who can talk to them and accepting the fact that those people will have to talk to them in ways that annoy us. In other words, they will not probably denounce Trump and Trumpism, and they will not probably um, want to talk much about the election. Um Yet, nevertheless, there are people who can somehow play a middling, useful role, and we should allow them to do it and praise them for doing it. I mean, I think Liz Cheney, even if you're annoyed that she spent four years um, enabling Donald Trump, I mean, she deserves praise for what she's done um, in the last few weeks. The same is true of Ben Sass and the others in Congress and the Senate um, who've agreed, because they those are people who still have a chance of being able to reach some of their former constituents. Um, and we should hope that they can that they can that they can serve that role. I mean, that's the general I idea of the argument, and we can go into more detail if 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 you want. But it's a, as I said, it's a little counterintuitive. Um, it annoys people who want you know justice, retribution. I don't know social media shaming of people who have um, who who supported the insurrection. Um, but it, but these are tactics that have worked in other places. Hmm. So part of the problem, and Damon, I'll bring you in. A part of the problem is that um, for for true cultists like the ones who attack the Capitol, and we don't know what percentage of the people who still support Trump. A recent poll said that thirteen percent of uh, only thirteen percent of Republicans uh, approve of a second impeachment, and thirty six percent of Republicans say that Trump did nothing wrong, nothing. Um, but anyway, we don't know what percentage of of uh, of people in America are true cultists. But for those who are, um, there aren't any trusted intermediaries. I mean, it must come from the God King himself. I mean, for, you know, the best example of that is that even Mike Pence, uh, you know, the faithful Lieutenant was, you know, went in the, in a trice, he went in an instant from, from being a, a, a someone that all of the Trump world respected to a sworn enemy, they were ready to lynch. So that's, that's a problem in, ter in terms of, um, you know, anybody who might play a mediating role, it seems to me, and I'd like your views on this, um, would be perhaps discredited the minute they attempted to undertake that role. Yeah, that's true. And that's one reason why, um, you know, I, I love this argument. I think Anne's piece is, is really important, probably the best single piece I've read, productive piece uh, since the insurrection and kind of thinking how we move beyond it in a, in a positive way. I remain a little skeptical about whether it actually could work. The reason why I, I, I keep plugging it, I plugged it last week at the end of the show, and I've written a column that's coming out on Friday this week uh, in which I plug it again, is that it's still the best option. And specifically because I think because it deliberately says avoid the politics. It it builds on a kind of classically liberal Tocquevillian notion of people uh, 
depriving civic benefits by engaging in common projects that don't necessarily have any direct political connection at all. Simply get people doing something together for a common aim and they will tend to build bridges and feel less alienated from one another. Um, so to the extent that, uh, that this is a project that would that would try to build on those kinds of sociological insights of the way that solidarity can get built from its from a lack of solidarity. Uh, it could potentially do some good. Um, and it could even do some good if some, as you said, Mona, kind of these sort of these figures in the Republican Party who sort of managed to straddle both camps, if they could, plug it in a way that is deliberately non-inflammatory and talk about it in terms that seemingly have no direct political ideological corollary. Uh, it, you know, maybe, again, this is not going to be the, 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 the ones who are deepest down the rabbit hole of conspiracism and, and alternative facts are not going to be movable. But it's always a spectrum. I mean, it's a spectrum that moves from uh, sort of people who held their nose in suburbs and voted for Trump just because of tax cuts and judges all the way across to people who kind of like Trump. But then, as the polls have shown after the insurrection said, well, that was a bridge too far. And then probably a step or two between there and the, the ones who are furthest in it. Um, and so we're talking about that kind of intermediary area, the the the, the people sort of swirling the rabbit hole drain who, <laughs> but who, who maybe could be pulled away from going all the way down. Yeah. Um, and, and if, and if even a, a handful, a couple million of those people can be recaptured to affirm, you know, ordinary liberal democratic norms and rules and law abidingness, that would be a very good benefit for the country. Yeah. Uh, and it's probably, I mean, Thing, it's it's likely it seems to me that the number who are you know near the drain but not down in it um, is probably way larger um, than the ones who are really uh, lost. Now, um, Linda, I'd be curious to hear um, your perspective on this, and also I, I just add this in. Um, one of the things that Anne talks about that sounds, uh, as Damon said, very promising is that you get people to work on something together that has nothing to do with these larger cultural and political divides. Um, but of course, right now, the biggest obstacle to that is the pandemic. To what, I mean, obviously, a lot of this craziness and uh, uh, irrational thinking predates uh, the pandemic. But to what degree do you think um, the lockdowns where people are just sitting there absorbing all of this stuff from their computers so many hours of the day has um, has made it that much worse? Oh, I think it's absolutely clear that it's made it worse. I mean, I think that um, people have time on their hands. They do not have the no, uh, normal kind of social outlets that they've had uh, through most of their lives. Uh, they can't see each other. Um, all of those things, I think, tend to exacerbate uh, problems for people. Uh, and clearly, many of these people have real emotional, psychological problems. I mean, people who get sucked down into the QAnon consp conspiracies, uh, people who join these very militant, uh, millenarian movements, um, you know, and start putting together food and creating bunkers, for, you know, for the uh, uh, apocalypse that is coming. All, all of those types of people, I think, have been made worse uh, because of the, the social situation. But I think Anne's ideas are very good ones. And I think they will be helped by the fact that, at least for the, a time, Donald Trump is not in everyone's face uh, mm -hmm. all the time. We're not being continuously egged on by him. But the other thing that is going to be necessary, I believe, is to make sure that some of the rhetoric coming out of the new administration doesn't exacerbate the uh, kinds of divisions. Um, I, I was disappointed this week, uh, not in anything he did in terms of the uh, executive orders on racial justice, 
um, but in some of the language that uh, was used by uh, President Biden, uh, you know, the continuous talks about systemic racism, I don't think these are particularly helpful. So I'd like to see Donald Trump stay out of the picture. Um, his craziest um, fans stay out of the picture. Uh, but I'd also like to make sure that uh, the new administration doesn't do things that simply rile up people. It's not to blame them uh, for what's happened, but it is to say that if we want to move forward, you have to, you can talk about unity, and, and I think that's good, but you also don't want to beat people over the head, uh, particularly those uh, who voted for Trump by basically saying, you know, we have a... Um, uh, irremediably uh, racist country. We live in a country that whose whole history is based on racial discrimination and that that hasn't changed, you know, in the past 250 years. So, um, <clears throat> Bill Galston, uh, one of the, one of the factors that is not going away and in, uh, it may actually be getting worse is, uh, the right wing media, infotainment sphere. Um, in the past week, we have seen, uh, or a couple of weeks, we've seen Fox News fire Chris Steyerwald, who was a pretty, you know, uh, down the middle journalist, and he was part of their elections team that had a role in calling the state of Arizona on election night for Biden. It turned out to be correct call, but the viewers were incensed. Um, and uh, elevating, uh, so they fired him and they elevated Maria Bartiromo, who has been one of the most um, most uh, flagrant uh, Trump boosters uh, at, the, at the network. And um, they are worried about a flanking move uh, from AON and Newsmax uh, taking their, their uh, crazy constituency. And the other night, Tucker Carlson, who I think may be the most dangerous man in America. I can't believe I'm saying that since I used to know the guy, but um, he he is now out on, you know, on his program, basically telling his viewers that when somebody tries to dissuade them from believing the QAnon conspiracies, that this is big government attempting to tell you what to think and that this is, an, this is Orwellian. He's, he's advising his listeners. Um, so that aspect of this bill is is not getting better. <clears throat> I can't argue with you, Mona. Uh, but Irving Crystal wants to distinguish between a problem and a condition. Uh, problems you can do something about, condition, conditions you have to live with. Uh, and I think, you know, Fox and OAN, uh, et cetera, are conditions that we're going to have to live with. Uh, it is not clear to me that consistent with our constitutional traditions, we can do anything about irresponsible partisan media. Uh, in, in times gone by, I supported the Fairness Doctrine, which would have made a lot of this much harder to pull off, if not, in, if not impossible. But uh, and I continue to support it in principle, but it's not coming back. Uh, let me now comment on what I'll call the Applebaum thesis, which I think is highly credible and very wise. Uh, just to add a couple of things to it, my own thoughts. Uh, number one, I paid very careful attention to what the people in the rally before the seizure of the Capitol building were saying and what people were saying at the seizure itself. And a large number of them had personal economic grievances related to the shutdown. You just heard that over and over again. Uh, small business people who had been driven to distraction or out of business entirely by, by the shutdown. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't attribute this all uh, to Donald Trump's rhetoric or what any other member of the Trump family had to say. I, th I think that there were, there were grievances that were exacerbated by the pandemic and the response to it. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the shutdowns that, 
governments of, in various states instituted were necessarily ill-advised, but they did have unintended consequences. This is, this is a big one. Number two, changing minds is one thing, changing behavior is another. And I think that in order to have a framework for peaceful coexistence, there must be rigorous adherence to the rule of law. And it has to be consistent adherence. Uh, behavior uh, of the kind that we saw on January 6th must not be tolerated. But behavior that looks like it, even if it has a different political valence, valence shouldn't be tolerated either. Uh, coexistence has to be peaceful coexistence, or it's not coexistence. And there, are, whatever people think, there are some things that they do or want to do that cannot be tolerated. That's my second point. Here's my third point. Uh, and this is an old man's point, but uh, <laughs> I think I'm going to make it anyway. Uh, the only healing agent that's effective is time. When people's minds can't be changed, uh, the, the memory of grievances has to be given time to fade. Uh, 40, uh, 30 years after the Civil War, people were still waving the bloody shirt. 40 years after the Civil War ended, uh, those issues finally became ancient history rather than current events. Uh, we're going to have to live with this for a long time. We have to do what we can to live with it peacefully. But whatever we do, it's not going away soon. Uh, thank you all for those uh, wise comments. Um, I, I would like to turn now to um, something that should cheer us all up and make us aware that, you know, we're lucky that we are not living in Russia uh, <laughs> because um, we saw an outbreak this week of um, protests across Russia. There were something like 100 cities where people took to the streets despite warnings not to by the FSB. Um, this was, of course, in protest of the jailing of Alexei Navalny, the clever, media-savvy uh, opponent of Putin who was poisoned, uh, what was it, six months ago or so, um, and, uh, and was recuperating. He was arrested upon his return, his very brave return to Russia, um, on the charge that uh, he failed to meet his... Uh, uh, parole obligations under a previous charge. <laughs> of course, the reason he failed to meet his parole was because he was recuperating from being nearly killed by Putin in a German hospital. But anyway, he's he is back. And uh, of course, he was jailed again, as I say. And um, I want to get a sense, Anne, I know you um, live part of the time in uh, in Poland, and uh, you keep a close eye on events uh, to your east. So, um, so I'd like to get your sense of um, Navalny. Uh, he seems, first of all, his his courage is just undeniable. Um, but I'm wondering, do you think of him as a Democrat, small d? So I should say I met Navalny. Um, it was okay. a long time ago. Um, he was not at all famous then, and he was sitting around somebody's kitchen table. Um, and he was introduced to me at that time as a sort of amusing, rather different, energetic kind of, you know, th thinker. Um, and he was originally also known as... Um, you know, as a as as a as a Russian nationalist, um, mm -hmm. he has said, for example, several things about, you know, approving of the of the Russian occupation of Crimea. Um, he's expressed some doubt about the independence of Ukraine and Georgia. Um, he use he has used that language um, in the past, and um, and he is you know he is a. This is one of the reasons why Ukrainian, um, you know. Ind independence-minded Ukrainians are nervous about him. Um, I should say, though, that the combination of nationalism and the combination of um, liberalism 
is not an unknown one. I mean, um, most countries that became democracies in the 19th century did so by fusing some sense of national identity with some desire for a more just state. Um, they do sometimes go together. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think it's also a little bit early. I mean, we should be so lucky as to have the problem of worrying about whether President Navalny is sufficiently <laughs> democratic or not. That's fair. Um, so it's, you know, we're a little ahead of the curve on that since he's probably about to go to prison for a decade. Mm. Um that seems to be the most likely outcome. Um, and the other thing I would say about it is that if you look at the crowds of people who came out, it's very possible in that crowd there were people who were definitely Democrats, who were definitely liberals. And the crowds, by the way, in dozens of cities all across the country. This is not just Moscow. Um, there were definitely Democrats. There were definitely liberals. There were definitely nationalists. And there were also just a lot of really pissed off young people. Um, who feel they live in a country that's deeply unfair, it's badly run, it's profoundly corrupt, um, and who were inspired by Navalny's act of bravery to protest. And just by the way, since not all Americans know this, what Navalny did is really extraordinary. So he was out of the country. He was flown out after being poisoned. He was rescued in a German hospital. While he was in Germany, he and his team finished up a video um, which is, it's a long video. It's two hours long. It's very worth watching though, if you've got the time. I watched um, it. Which is a deep dive into Putin's personal finances connected to, although not only to a vast and kind of grotesque palace that he's built on the Black Sea. Navalny put, you know, flew back into the country and on the day he flew back with his wife, they published that video online. So he knew he was going to prison. He knew that this offensive thing, which now has upwards of 80, 90 million viewers, um, was going online. And yet he did it anyway. So this act of bravery has inspired a whole lot of people. Um, whether that is correctly described as a democratic movement or a nationalist movement or just a movement of really angry people, um, it's very hard to say. We have no polling in Russia or anything like that. Um, but I, but I do think that the, you know, there can be multiple impulses behind a, or multiple um, motivations. Um, for a person like that. And, you know, I am willing for the moment anyway to tolerate, you know, this I, Navalny's nationalist instincts if he is also inspiring people to think and talk about political change. I would, I would, I would leave it at that. And as I said, the chances of him actually becoming president and this becoming a realistic problem we have to deal with right now seem, seem very slim and we should be so lucky as to have that problem. Uh, yes. Um, Linda, uh, doesn't this underscore, <clears throat> excuse me, the importance of the individual in history? Um, I mean, you know, the, there is just no doubt that his particular set of qualities, most of all his his tremendous personal courage, um, are inspiring to millions of people around the world in a way that nothing else would be. Um, and, uh, you know, no Navalny, no huge movement against corruption uh, in, in Russia. I mean, you would still have a lot of discontented people, but now you have a movement and, and it is it is really a, a testament to the importance of these individuals, isn't it? I think that's right. Um, and uh, individuals and individual character matters tremendously. Uh, it's something that conservatives always used to understand and somehow forgot that lesson about five years ago mm -hmm. uh, when it came to our own country. But, you know, the whole question on, on Navalny, um, you know, raises also the fact that we, uh, President Biden this week, had his first call, I guess, with uh, Putin. And what a, a difference an administration makes. Uh, apparently, he brought up uh, the jailing of Navalny. He also brought up the tremendous uh, hack uh, on American uh, cybersecurity. Uh, he apparently uh, talked about um, the uh, issue of, of um, the um, bounties that were put on the heads of American soldiers. He brought up all sorts of very unpleasant topics that Donald Trump never did. And I think it really does suggest going forward. I mean, on Navalny, um, I, you know, I would defer to Anne on this, but if he goes away for 10 years, I mean, I, you know, it's, it, 
one they they tried to kill him when he was out and operating publicly uh why not uh you know get the job done once he's uh in in their control. Oh, well, by the way, can I just interject right yeah. there um, that his most recent statement uh, that he made from prison was uh, that he's in perfect health now. He does not have any f- suicidal feelings um, right. That, right. <laughs> and that, you know, et cetera, as yeah. a way to say, look, if something happens to me, you'll know why. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, you know, what is really sad, and, and, and in some ways, I think what Anne said about Navalny also points to this, is that, you know, Freedom House used to do the wonderful map every year showing the decline or advance of democracy around the world. They still Back, do. Now, yes, I guess they still do. I don't see it as, as much as I used to then. Uh, but, you know, the fact is, democracy around the world has been in retreat. Um, it's not been on the advance and and knows that better than uh, any of us with respect to what's happened in, in Eastern Europe. Yep. Um, you know, the McKinsey company, uh, Bill Galston, was very courageous. They put out a message to their employees in Moscow that uh, they were not to say a word about Navalny. The word Navalny was not to pass anyone's lips. Um, so some things never change. Um, <laughs> uh, but l- let me just describe to you, um, uh, the, the, the palace, the Black Sea Palace, um, and it had an underground hockey rink, an aqua disco, a movie theater, a private casino, and a velvety hookah lounge outfitted with its own retractable stripper pole. Uh, parent uh, estimated cost one point five billion dollars. Um, so uh, so, Bill. Um, I guess my. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you whether you approve. What am I uh, supposed to say? <laughs> um, uh, but I guess um, I my question for you is: um, Do you think? Um, apropos of Linda's comments, that we will see an improvement, an important improvement from the Biden approach? Uh, With regard to our relationship with Russia? Correct. Uh, Well, I think, uh, as has been discussed earlier in this show, uh, the the tone and the substance of the very first conversation between uh, between Biden and Putin were very different. Uh, this is the first administration in a very long time, I think really since shortly after the end of the Cold War, uh, that has not taken office with plans to quote unquote reset relations with Russia. Uh, I think the the Biden people, for all sorts of reasons, are disposed to believe with the, with Russia, what you see is what you get, uh, and until Putin leaves the scene, and there are other structural changes, and they're not building their policy on those assumptions. Uh, I think they have a realistic view of what Putin is trying to do in. In Crimea, the the Donbass, the near abroad. Uh, I think that they understand the the truth about the repeated Russian efforts uh, to use information technology to disrupt our economy and our politics. Uh, And uh, they, they understand, as any sane administration will, that there are areas where continued cooperation on the basis of of self-interest is essential, like, for example, the extension of the New START Treaty, which isn't a perfect treaty, but having it is a lot better than not having it, at least in my opinion, and the others others who disagree. Uh, So I think we're, we're in for wintry relationships between the United States and Russia through the Biden administration, unless f- something fundamental changes. And Mr. Putin makes a gesture to defuse at least one significant area of conflict. I'm not, I'm not saying Absolutely. what it should be. Uh, and uh, 
you know, so I'd say I'd say with with the administration on both Russia and China, good start. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you how do you frame sustainable long run policies around that good start? Uh, in that connection, let me just briefly drop a footnote to a major new publication out of the Atlantic Council called The Longest Telegram, uh, which, you know, in which an anonymous author <clears throat> tries to do for our, our China policy uh, what the famous long telegram by George Cannon tried to do for our long-term stance towards the Soviet Union back in the late 1940s. Um, Damon, uh, Putin was reduced to um, denying, publicly denying that he owned this palace, which uh, which is interesting. Uh, uh, somebody tweeted, I don't know if you saw it, but, you know, so the guy in jail is dictating what the uh, dictator talks about, um, which is a remarkable, a remarkable thing. Uh, and a, a use of the free Internet. I, I wonder how much longer that will last in, in Russia. Um, it's a lot freer in Russia, as I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, much freer internet in Russia than in China. Um, and, uh, and Navalny's been able to take advantage of that by posting these videos and so forth. Um, and, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it is, it is a, um, so, so perhaps what we're seeing in Russia, Damon, is uh, an example of the good that can be done through social media and through uh, the internet, whereas we here on this side of the Atlantic are suffering the worst aspects of it. What do you think? Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the internet is an incredibly effective motor for insurgency. And if, uh, depending on who, what the what or who the power uh, power that be <laughs> happens to be at a given moment will determine in a way who's vulnerable to this power. So if Putin, Putin's sitting there in charge for seemingly endless years or decades, and uh, if he faces an effective person who, who can uh, charismatically marshal that power against him, he will be vulnerable to it. And it won't matter if the guy's in jail, because uh, as long as he has allies outside who can drop a potentially viral video online or tweet a certain thing um, and and get it sucked up into the international network of, of kind of digital interfaces, then it can be effective at mobilizing people and mobilizing public opinion. Uh, I mean, really, if we pivot back to our situation as a contrast, I mean, the in retrospect, the single talent that Donald Trump possessed was as a demagogue. Really, he was not good at anything else related to being president or a politician at all, except he was incredibly effective at mobilizing a certain segment of Americans to to uh, take on certain entrenched power structures that Trump wanted to overpower or manipulate. And uh, but. It, it doesn't have to be that it's always a malign influence. I mean, the, of course, the, the Arab Spring didn't turn out the way all of us would have liked in the end. But, uh, you know, all those stories from back in the day about how the Arab Spring was made possible because of uh, social media and Google and, and all kinds of, of digital uh, uh, networking that was going on among the protesters is absolutely true. And it could be true again there or in other regions of the world. Um, the trick is that, again, this sort of never ends. So uh, it, it's an incredibly powerful vehicle for destabilization. Uh, yeah. The question is what happens when when the good guys get in and uh, there's then a new cohort of people utilizing those those means to destabilize them. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of the world we live in now. But certainly Navalny seems to be a, a very effective and cagey uh, opponent to Putin. And uh, I can't help but be cheered by it, even if the underlying digital structures that are making it possible continue to to worry me a little bit. Uh, but then again, um, I worry about a lack of control. 
Yeah, right. No, agreed. I, and by the way, for anybody who's interested, I, I would suggest checking out some of his videos on YouTube. They are very clever and very entertaining. And you can see why he, at least part of why he has such a devoted following. Um, now, earlier, Bill Galston talked about the importance of the rule of law and adhering to law. So that brings us to um, the the uh, impeachment, upcoming impeachment trial for the president. Um, I think everybody on this uh, podcast agrees that the president should bear uh, should 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 pay some consequence for what he did. But it's looking like it's looking less and less likely that that will be a a censure a. a um, Rule, uh, a uh, impeachment by the Senate that is a conviction and a ruling that he is ineligible to serve in office again. Uh, because this week we had 45 senators, uh, Bill Galson, I'll go to you first, all Republican, um, who voted for Rand Paul's resolution saying the impeachment was unconstitutional. And among those was Mitch McConnell. Uh, who earlier had suggested he would be open to uh, impeachment, or at least he had he had given it out that he might be. So, um, uh, does this mean that uh, that uh, this is a, a defeat for accountability and the rule of law in America? Uh, it's a defeat only for people who imagined that another outcome was possible. Uh, as I think I've said before, the only way that conviction in the Senate had a chance. Uh, would have been for Mitch McConnell to publicly declare his support for it and persuade enough of his colleagues that purging the Republican Party was impossible unless and until they made it impossible for Donald Trump to return as president. Uh, And McConnell made the opposite decision, as you said, Uh, The constitutional issue is a perfect cover story, perfect. Uh, And there is legitimate debate among constitutional scholars as to whether it would be constitutional to, uh, you know, to convict someone who's no longer in office. I know that various precedents from the Civil War era have been cited, but if you look at those precedents, they don't say what (laughs) their proponents uh, say they're saying, and it's a genuinely undecided question. So it's it's not flat irresponsible or hypocritical for a senator to take the position, more in sorrow than in anger, uh, that, well, I'd love to do something, but my hands are tied by the Constitution. Uh, If Donald Trump is going to pay a price, if he's going to be held accountable, uh, it will be in through the three ways. Uh, through the ordinary legal system, through the bankruptcy courts, and in the eyes of history. Um, and um, if you were a senator, uh, hope a Republican senator, uh, wouldn't you want to ensure that for the rest of your career, you would not have to have hanging over your head the fear that your family would be harassed on the way to the supermarket, that your life would be threatened, um, and so on by the Trumpkins uh, because they, because he was still out there and still threatening to run for president again in 2024. Well, this is one of the psychological aspects of this story that I don't understand because. It seems to me that from the perspective of Republicans in the Senate and other leaders of the Republican Party, getting rid of Donald Trump, putting him off the, you know, out of the game, you know, solves a lot of problems. Um, Because the idea that because one of the things that's clearly going to happen is when the Senate once again refuses to convict Trump, which we have to now assume will happen, I imagine the same thing will happen that we saw after the Mueller investigation let him off the hook, after the first impeachment. Trump will be re-empowered. He will say, I am innocent. I am a victim. You know, all that grievance will well out and well over and infect his supporters. Um, you have, you know, traduced me and he will come roaring back and he will make their lives miserable. So why even, I mean, forget justice, you know, forget patriotism. Why not? Why from the perspective of just Mm self-preservation, you know, why don't they want him out of the game? Why don't they want him impeached? I, I, I'm mystified and I don't have a good answer. 
And even people like Rob Portman, who's retiring at the end of his term, not seeking re-election, uh, was not among those uh, who voted to let the thing proceed. Uh, it's amazing. Linda, um, your friend and mine, Nikki Haley, actually, she's not my friend, but uh, she- <laughs> Nor mine. <laughs> okay. She said um, on the Laura Ingram show, she said, um, oh, they, this is, this is the, the new Republican line you can see. Okay. They beat him up before he came into office, they beat him up while he was in office and they're beating him up even after he's in office. I mean, at some point, give the man a break, she oh, said. In my culture, we say, oh, pobrecito, <laughs> poor, poor little one. Oh, I yes. feel so sorry for him. I mean, this is just disgusting. Um, I, I just find um, the way in which we see people who want to run for president primarily pandering over this. Uh, you know, re regardless of whether or not you agreed with his policies, and as we've discussed many times, uh, I agreed with many of his policies, not all of them uh, for sure, but many of them. But the man was very damaging to American democracy, and he should not be treated in this way. And the more, you know, uh, Kevin McCarthy is going down to kiss his ring today, uh, mm -hmm. down to Florida. Um, the more we see of that, the more they keep him alive. And I happen to agree with Bill. I think the criminal justice system uh, and our tax system may, in fact, uh, be the end of Donald Trump. I think, frankly, his involvement in his politics is going to take a very far back seat to his trying to maintain what he has left of his wealth and uh, trying to get him out of some of the legal difficulties he's in. So he should be just allowed to, you know, go off into the sunset and play golf down at his many golf courses, which are not doing very well. Um, and, and we ought not to be seeing these Republicans feeling like they still owe him something. They owe him nothing. And uh, he will continue to damage them. And I think uh, he has totally damaged the Republican Party. It's hard to see how it's going to recover from this, and in, in, certainly in the near future. Well, Damon, the Republican Party does not see it that way. Um, the uh, as as our friend uh, Bill Crystal tweeted this week, um, uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, has been more critical of of, um, of uh, Li uh, Liz Cheney than of uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, and by the way, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the QAnon congresswoman who uh, has many other sins to her account, um, has been assigned to the Education and Labor Committee, which is a plum assignment uh, in Congress. Um, so all, I mean, the, the signs are everywhere that, um, you know, a Texas legislator has induced, introduced a law that would have Texas secede. Sarah Sanders is running for governor of Arkansas. The Oregon GOP um, has uh, announced that the uh, issued a formal position that uh, the attack on the Capitol was a false flag operation mounted by Antifa. Um, and uh, so the Republican Party, uh, you know, with some honorable exceptions, and we all know their names. Um, in fact, unfortunately, we can count them on two hands. Um, the, the party is getting, even as Trump slinks off, the party is getting more Trumpy, not less. Right. Although I, I have no objection for now to describing it as Trumpy as because we don't have a word for it exactly. I mean, we could we could probably come up with some colorful ones, but let's use that for now. I do think it's important to realize that especially now that Trump is receding, he's been effectively silent for uh, you know, over two weeks now, uh, he did have a little speech on the morning he left the White House, but it didn't get a huge amount of play because it got swamped by uh, Biden's inaugural address and all the events that day. But he's effectively gone silent uh, si since a few days after the January 6th insurrection. And yet we're seeing everything you just listed. You could also throw in the, the insanity that comes out of the Arizona GOP every day, mm -hmm. uh, the Pennsylvania Republican Party, which uh, a decade ago was was fairly mainstream. Uh, you know, Senator Toomey uh, represented the kind of uh, kind of libertarian right wing fringe of the Republican Party when he was elected. <laughs> and he's now kind of the one of the primary rhinos considered in, in the body 
because he's been outflanked so far on the right. I think it's important to recognize that Trump has been incredibly decisively important in this development. But in the end, I don't think that he is decisive as a person anymore. This is beyond Trump. He has flipped over large segments of this party into a new style of politics, and it could attach itself to him again, but it might not. It's free floating and it's looking for new tribunes around the country. And you see them in the Senate all kind of vying to be that person, the the, uh, the the various wannabes from the slightly more sensible Cotton and Nikki Haley to out to Ted Cruz and Hawley and all and anyone else in that in that direction. But the idea is that um, it is out there and it is threatening to primary any person who defies it. And again, it's it, not necessarily him. Defending, standing with Trump in the impeachment is now sort of a proxy for are you with us or against us? Are you, uh, do you believe that the kind of mainstream narrative that a Mitt Romney endorses in the Democratic Party and the mainstream media endorses true? Or is it this kind of upside down world where actually Trump Trump won in a landslide and it was all stolen from him. And and so I don't uh, I, I, th I think it's a little bit of an error at this point to attribute this behavior solely to fear of Trump, the person. I think it's now well beyond him and it's kind of out on its own, doing its own damage on its own uh, on its own agency. Okay. Um, on that note, uh, we're going to have to bid a fair, fond farewell to Anne because she has to jump off. Um, so thank you so much, Anne, for joining us. Uh, it was great to have you and I uh, hope you will come back soon. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you all, I don't know, spiritually or <laughs> cyberly and yeah. maybe in real life sometime soon. That would be wonderful. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Okay, here's what I'm going to su suggest, Jim, is that we close out this um, version, let everybody upload, and then we start a new one and do our last segment. Okay. 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 Excellent. Okay, hang on one second. Let me get my papers. Okay. In three, two, one. Uh, always great to hear from Ann Applebaum. Uh, and now we turn to our final segment where we highlight something that we think needs more attention. So Linda, I'll go first to you. Well, I'm going to give you a bit of good news. And that is, well, it's not great news, but it's better news than we often get out of the state of Arizona. Apparently, Kelly Ward, the crazy woman who has mm -hmm. led the Arizona uh, GOP, uh, had was up for re-election, and she almost got defeated. She was uh, running against Sergio Arellano, and he apparently drew 48.5%, uh, and she got just over 51% of the vote. So she ended up winning. I thought you but, said this was good news. <laughs> well, but but the fact that almost half of the state party was ready to throw the crazy woman over, um, I thought that was pretty good news. I mean, she's okay. you know supposedly been popular, and uh, I think it means, and he didn't, you know, no one expected her to even face much of a challenge. So I do think that there um, is an uh, uprising coming in Arizona politics. Uh, I think that uh, Jeff Flake uh, noted recently that over 9,000 Republicans left right after the January 6 uh, insurrection at the Capitol. And that, I think, means that, you know, we already saw that uh, Republicans lost Arizona. And who knows, maybe next time around, they will actually knock off Kelly Ward. Okay. Well, and uh, for what it's worth, I'll throw in the fact that the Virginia Senate actually sanctioned Amanda Chase, member of the Virginia Senate running for governor, complete nutcase who praised the rioters as patriots and has committed any number of other sins, encouraged the president to declare martial law and so forth. So she's been sanctioned, including by three Republicans. That's not 
nothing, I guess. Bill Galson. Yeah, we seem to be defining good news down. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so be it. Uh, I have a file folder at home labeled Annals of Human Stupidity. Uh, <laughs> Very thick file, is it? A very thick file. And if I live a really long life and I've run out of other things to do, I'm going to write it up into a really snippy book, uh, (laughs) which will give me a great deal of gratification to write, even if no one reads it. Uh, At any rate, uh, the Gallup organization just discussed today a poll that it commissioned and conducted recently on the willingness of frontline healthcare workers and first responders to get vaccinated. Here, friends, are the results. 49% said that they were willing to get vaccinated. 34% uh, said they weren't. And 18% said, well, I'm not sure, check back with me. Okay, so these are the most vulnerable people in the entire workforce, and not even half of them are willing to get vaccinated. How are we supposed to understand this? Hmm. Uh, that's it's worrisome, all right. Um, and uh, some of it is, I I would guess. Uh, I would guess, you know, the anti-vaxxer paranoia that's out there. And the other part is the biggest part is probably the Trump misinformation. Damon. Well, I actually uh, will break from tradition and be the true uh, cheery optimist today um, with my selection. Um, And and this will go in in the category of let's really double and triple down on realizing that we are past the Trump era and we're back to politics being about what policies should we pursue to make the country better. And on that note, I want to point to um, a, uh, a relatively new sub stack that has been launched by Matthew Iglesias. Now, for r- listeners who aren't like looped into the journalism world, Substack is basically like a blogging platform that an, um, an enormously large number of prominent journalists have joined in recent months uh, to kind of be independent and no longer kind of overseen by editors who seem to feel like they're constraining them or if they get canceled and have to go out on their own, they join Substack. Matt Iglesias, who was co-founder of the website Vox, ended up quitting there a few months ago and started the Substack. It is so good. Hmm. He, he publishes one fairly lengthy policy-related post a day during the week, and it arrives in my email early in the morning, so it's there when I first wake up. And almost all five days a week, it is provocative, interesting, fun, very smart. Just to give you a taste of what you'll find there this Monday, this week, the item is fixing the police will take more funding, not less. It needs to be it needs to be way easier to fire cops and that will cost money. Very solid piece of, of uh, kind of police reform, uh, pushing back against defund the police in a, in a smart way. Then on Tuesday, you can't blame bad leaders for everything. The public is troublingly tolerant of bad COVID response. Another excellent piece. On Wednesday, the uh, it, I'd say it's a kind of a very wonky headline, so I'll skip it. But it's about gentrification and about how the left's uh, attack on gentrification doesn't really make a lot of sense. And he brings in some good, solid uh, economic data and research to make his point for him. So, uh, again, he, Matt is definitely a center left guy. He's been on the podcast before. Um, uh, but he's doing very good work here, both for the sake of advancing policy conversation, but also in pushing back again, some of the, the less sensible arguments that emanate from, uh, from his left. So, uh, it's good work and it's fun, uh, and smart. So I recommend it to everyone. Excellent. We'll have to have him back if he will join us again. I hope you um, Yes. All right. I have two items uh, really quick. One is um, that, as you know, there are um, new variants of the coronavirus 
uh, that are showing up around the world. There's a Brazilian one, a South African one, the UK one, and so forth. And there's another one that seems to have originated here uh, in the US. Um, but um, but we are um, not really handling this very well. Um, this, this, it seems to me, needs immediate attention. And uh, I hope that the administration will consider the old-fashioned quarantine that other countries do and that we have done very inconsistently and badly. Um, we've sort of encouraged people to quarantine um, when they get here from these countries. First of all, travel bans are good, but also uh, enforcing quarantines either by making sure people stay in a hotel for 10 days or whatever until they can pass a negative test. Um, um, or um, there are other other things that other countries do. And uh, we should seriously consider that because um, some of these new variants, I mean, we're, we're already lagging in terms of immunization and some of these variants may be a little bit more resistant to the uh, vaccine. So that just seems to me to be common sense. I hope we will look into that. And the second thing is just to echo a point that has been made by two former guests on this podcast, Charles Lane uh, and Catherine Rampell, Namely, that the Democrats are looking at huge amounts of spending, which is fine. We are in a really serious emergency. But a lot of their spending on uh, coronavirus relief envisions sending money to everyone. This is a terrible idea. There are lots of Americans, uh, myself included, who do not need the money and um, who are not you know, facing real uh, emergencies and therefore should not be getting checks. And it should be more narrowly tailored uh, to people who have been hurt or who are below a certain income level or something. I mean, it just makes no sense to send uh, checks to everyone and deepen the deficit <clears throat> for those who really aren't in need. <clears throat> Pardon me. And with that, we thank you all for listening and we will be back next week as every week. Thank you.